<laughs> Father, we just thank you that, that you, Lord Jesus, are faithful and that you are true, that all your words are true, that they are yes and amen in you. And we just thank you for your great faithfulness, how you have been with us these years, and, and you will be to the very end. You were the Alpha and the Omega. And Lord, we just come and, and bow our hearts low before you this morning, and we just thank you for what you're doing in this hour. We thank you that you're preparing a bride in, our, in us, Lord God, and in your people. You want a vessel that will that is, is ready to marry your son, oh God, and we want to be that vessel. We know that we're not there, but we know that we're in this preparation, and I just cry out that you will give us this day a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation, that revelation light would just flood into our heart, yes. that we will not just hear with our soul, but we will hear in our spirit, man, what it is you're saying, Lord, that you will give a, a new, re a just not a, even a new revelation, but just the revelation of Jesus. As Ken is speaking, open up our hearts, our spirits. We open up our hearts. Hearts. We open our spirit to you who has the words of life, yeah, and we yes, want that yes. word of life to pierce us in our spirit, Lord God. We want to hear so that we can really have that deep knowing of you. It's not a solical knowing of you, but it's a deep knowing, that epinosis, if I'm pronouncing it right, that deep knowing of you, and that's our heart cry, to know you in that place. And I just pray that you just come to us, Lord, and you just hover over us, and you just minister to hearts today, giving that revelation light of of what you're saying about the bridegroom and what you're saying about all this to where it's not just, just as I just prayed, it's just not just the knowing, it's through you, through you, through your precious and magnificent promises that we can take hold and become partakers of your divine nature. And Lord, we just ask that you come and you teach us these things and you open these things up to us where eye has not seen and ear has not heard all that you have prepared for those who love you. And Lord, we just cry out that you you speak through Ken. Lord, we just pray, Father, that one thought you gave me earlier was that he would be, you pull that select error. You've called us him to be a select error and that he will pull forth that error, Lord, that word, oh God, today, and it would even go into the atmosphere and that it would bring life. God, life-giving words, and we pray that you speak through him, Lord. Just take him out of the way, and we just pray that you will come and you will speak not by power nor by might but by your spirit in Jesus name amen amen well welcome uh, everyone this is uh, session five of our uh, uh, forerunner school class uh, a theology of the bride and it's the uh, the bride the title of the session is the bride uh, in Revelation in the book of Revelation the bride in the book of Revelation part three so uh, as you know we've dealt with part one and part two and this is the last session related to to the book of, the, of looking at the bride in Revelation and they're about there are about six different passages in the book of Revelation that deal directly with the, the bride of Christ and the relationship between Jesus as our bridegroom king and us as the bride, about making ourselves ready, about the eternal destiny, the eternal destination of the bride, uh, and all of the issues there. And for the forerunner school, for forerunners, it's absolutely essential. If you're going to be a forerunner, it's absolutely essential that you have a real deep insight into the bride. Uh, into not only just the overview of that there will be a bride and that Jesus will be married to that bride, but the details of how to support that uh, the bride must make herself ready and the eternal uh, destiny uh, of the bride. And so we dealt with some of those. We dealt with Revelation chapter 2 and 3, which is the uh, kind of the invitation to be an overcomer. Uh, in those seven churches and a lot of the promises and, and uh, the exhortations as well are related to uh, a bridal paradigm. So we dealt with that. We dealt with Revelation chapter 12, which deals with, deals with the man-child 
uh, and remember the man child uh, uh, made herself ready, overcame by the blood of the lamb, the word of her testimony, and love in her life, n even not into uh, to death. And so that as well has a bridal uh, point to it. And then Revelation 19, 7 through uh, 8 and 9, we dealt with the bride making herself ready. Uh, and which would end the church age. And so in sessions one or three and four, but the, the first two sessions on the book of Revelation and the bride, we dealt with those passages. And now we're going to deal with uh, another passage in Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And then we're also going to deal with Revelation chapters 21 uh, and 22. We're going to look at the, at the, at the outcome. Uh, the bride, you know, if we look at our picture that we're, uh, that we're dealing with in terms of our journey through the book, the bride in Revelation 19, 7 has made herself ready. She's been clothed with, uh, with bridal garments, fine linen, uh, bright and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. That ends the church age. The church age ends and the very, not the very next verse, but a, a couple of verses later, the heavens open up. And Jesus returns. Uh, and I know as days get darker and darker and darker, the bride is going to say, uh, the spirit empowering the bride will say, come, Lord Jesus. And, and so we want to look at that. And I want to look at it, I want to look at it with a real sense of excitement and expectancy that this is where we're headed. Yes, we may be, there may be issues now. There are issues. In all of our lives, there are issues. Some are going through things that are harder than others right now. There are issues. There are issues in the world. You know, you just look at some of the things that are going on around the world, and it just it takes away a lot of your hope, a lot of your expectation, a lot of your joy. But when you look at it, that this is not the end that the end is when the Lord returns. It's not even, that's not the end, but the, the, the end of the heartache is when the Lord returns. And it's, it's a time of expectation. But in these messages also, I want to I wanna continue to challenge us that the bride has to make herself ready. And we'll be looking at that in, in both of these uh, uh, passages that we'll be dealing with in this, uh, in this session. The bride must make herself ready but there's a great destiny uh, assigned potentially for every one of us that we want to get excited about. Amen? 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 Give me a good amen. 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 Okay. All right. That's good. All right. We're going to look first at Revelation 19, starting with verse 11, uh, going through verse 21. And I hate to read this much Scripture, I know it's boring, but I think uh, when you kind of just read it, but I think it's important because this is... This passage for me was not one that I really dealt a lot with until I really started digging into this topic. But it's really an important uh, aspect of this. So the, again, the context is in Revelation 17 and 19, uh, 7, 8, and 9, uh, the, Lord, the bride has made herself ready. The church age has ended with the bride making herself ready. Two verses later, beginning with verse 11, uh, the the Lord returns, but there's, there's more to it than that. So here, let's read this. Revelation 19, starting with verse 11. And I saw, John saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and he wages war. So when he come, when the Lord returns, he's going to come and he's going to bring judgment and he's going to bring war, but not war with you and me. We're going to be on his side uh, in terms of the war uh, with the kings of the earth, the Antichrist, the false prophet. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And, 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 and listen to this. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Does that sound familiar? Hopefully it does. We're, <laughs> uh, 
where the, the armies clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So anybody know how to ride, do horseback riding? You better learn because we're going to be riding on white horses. Hallelujah. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he may rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce, fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's get excited now. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, All the birds which fly in the midheaven come and assemble for the great supper of God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses of those who sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So when he returns, there's going to be a war. It's going to be a battle. Uh, and now he's going to win, thankfully. It won't be much of a fight, but he, there it will be a war. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. By which, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Um, now, I mean, I know that's, there, there's an excitement in there, but it's like, wow, that, that's pretty unbelievable thing. But anyway, when the Lord, when the heavens open, the bride has made herself ready, the Lord is going to come back. And with him are going to be, the, going to be armies. And armies of, of uh, and we'll deal with who the armies are, but, uh, but armies will be with him. And they will go to war against the Antichrist. They'll go to war against the false prophet. They'll go to war against the kings of the, of the earth. And they will defeat them. And then they will proceed from there through, through, from the battle into the Jerusalem where Jesus will take his seat on the throne of David in Jerusalem and reign there for a thousand years. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's exciting to me. Now, it's gonna, there's going to be a processional. What, I'm, gonna, what I'm hoping I can uh, uh, communicate with this is to get you excited and say, I want to be a part of this great army. I want to be a part of this processional that's going to come uh, from heaven and, 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 and battle the, the kings of the earth. You know, the more I hear from Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum, the, most I, the more I want to be a part of this army to battle the kings of the earth. I say, you know, I've had enough of their global plans. I want to see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords return and defeat all those where he would be the ruler, where the kings of the earth would no longer, no longer rule, no longer be the elite of the earth, that, the, that, that Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords would be the king, the only one worthy of our praise and our honor. I want to be a part of that. And that's where, that's what's coming. That's what's coming. He is coming back. And there won't be much of a battle because the, the, the sword will come from his mouth and he'll speak his words and the enemy will be defeated and he will be the only one who reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But there's a processional. There's a processional. That's why I, I want you to see this. There's a grand processional coming that, and I'll give you a little bit of hint, some of those on the white horses are us if we make ourselves ready. There's a grand processional. You know, when I first started reading about Jesus' second coming, I thought, okay, he lands on the Mount of Olives and, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, he's in Jerusalem. But it's not going to be like that. It's a lot more of a processional. Now, I don't really know what it is. The point I... 
the point I want to make is there will be a probably a prolonged processional. You, you know, when you, when you think, and we'll deal with this more in the next session, but, you know, on Palm Sunday, Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey to give the invitation to make himself ready. But now he's going to come back on a white horse in authority to those who have made, with those who have made themselves ready. But there's a procession. You, know, you look at it, okay, uh, his, he stands on Mount, the Mount of Olives. That's pretty close to Jerusalem, just a few kilometers away from the, the old city, the, the place where he'll probably be. But then you see also that the Battle of Armageddon, which is part of where he'll go, is in uh, the, the Valley of Megiddo in the, well, the Valley of Jezreel, the Hill of Megiddo in the Valley of Jezreel which is about 90 kilometers, which would be about 60 miles uh, from Jerusalem. It says in Isaiah 63 that he'll be coming from Edom. Edom is southern Jordan. He'll be dressed uh, in red, coming there. So, I mean, some even say that he's come, he'll be dealing with Egypt. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I don't know exactly his journey. Uh, but I'll say this. There's going to be a grand processional where he comes and defeats his enemies before taking his seat in the throne on the throne in Jerusalem to rule for a thousand years. It's, there's going to be a processional. And there's two aspects to this processional. And, and I hope you're getting to, to the point. My, my goal was to say, I, I know this is my desire. Oh, man, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part. I want, to, I, I want so much to be a part of this grand processional uh, that will go through the land, defeating the enemy, and then uh, celebrating with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But there's two aspects to it. First, it's the processional of a conquering king. It's the processional of one who has been victorious. You know, back in, back in that day, uh, you know, when Rome ruled Jerusalem, which is a, was basically the time when John wrote the book of, of Revelation, the, the Roman generals, when they had conquered a city, they would, they would, bring, they would go and march through Rome uh, and, on a white horse, and they would bring the, the booty of all the stuff that they had captured from that land. And it was like the conquering king would come back. And you can imagine, because Rome ruled Jerusalem at this point in time, and, you know, the Lord was giving him this picture that this time it won't be Rome. It'll be the king of kings and the Lord of lords who will be riding that white horse in, in, as a conquering king. It's a powerful, uh, powerful picture. I know when, when Donna and I went to, we, we were able to go to Italy for our 50th wedding, wedding anniversary. And that was a, right before COVID hit. So we were blessed to be able to go and be free to tour. And so, anyway, we went to the Colosseum. And when you go to the Colosseum, you get to go to the Cap, Capitoline Hill or whatever. And the, so the tour guide would say, no, okay, and here's the uh, archway of Titus. And... She said, yeah, and Titus, that, you know, he came, this is when, to celebrate his conquering of Jerusalem, when he destroyed Jerusalem, and they came back. And so I did some, re you know, a little bit of research on it. And what happens is that the king is able to march through Rome uh, on a white horse with all the stuff that he has gathered. And this, this was to honor Titus because uh, he had defeated Jerusalem. Now, this was a number of years after that had happened. But it was that arch, it's symbolic of riding through the, that gate as the conquering king. And when Jesus returns, that's, what he, that's the picture. He's going to be the conquering king, returning to earth to rule as king of kings and lord of lords. I'm, well, I'm excited about being a part of that. And there'll be uh, th those dressed in fine linen, white and clean, will be with him on that journey. 
It's, so it's the, it's the journey of a conquering king, but it's also the processional is not only of a conquering king, but also of the bridegroom coming for, to celebrate the wedding. You know, you, we looked at this in session two about the betrothal, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish wedding system, and I think it was step seven or one of the, one of the steps, I believe it was seven, uh, was the wedding processional that went uh, and to the, the groom's house where the marriage ceremony and the, and the marriage feast were celebrated. And there was a processional that went through the city there. And this is going to be what's happened. This is the wedding processional as well. Not only is it the processional of the conquering king and his army, it's the processional of the bridegroom and his betrothed bride to, be, for, to celebrate the consummation of the wedding. You know, I've been telling you as I've been teaching this the, that you ought to watch this movie, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, and Donna and I watched it uh, uh, two or three weeks ago. And I, didn't, I did not, had not noticed this scene the first time. But they had the wedding processional. And, you know, it was at night. It was uh, uh, dark at night. Uh, and the groom and the bride and all the uh, people in the village with their lanterns were, were walking marching in, a, in, a, in a, a celebration in a processional to the place where the wedding was actually going to take place. And that's what, we're, that's what this is. It'll be that. And there'll be celebration, and there'll be singing, and there'll be dancing. Uh, there won't, it won't be whether we're going to win or lose this battle. It will be to execute the judgment of the king upon those who have opposed him, and then to bring this, his bride into that place where the consummation of the wedding ceremony will be. So it'll be a time of great celebration, great excitement, singing and dancing and honoring the king. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. You don't see me. You're looking at your faces. You don't look like you're that excited about it. Is anybody excited about when a part of that? Great procession. Okay, well, give a shout unto the Lord. Say, yes, 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 yes. We want to be, we want to be a part of this grand procession. Now let's look at who this army is. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Who is this army? Uh, let's look and see what the scriptures say uh, about the army. One, the army accompanying Christ includes his angels. You know, it says that, Jesus said that in Matthew 25. He said, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. He will come back with his angels. You know, there are other scriptures, and in your notes I've put uh, more of those scripture verses. Uh, but 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10, uh, I won't read all of that. Uh, but he'll be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord. And so anyway, there's more uh, to it there. So you see, I'm trying to paint a picture of this processional. you got the, Jesus in his glorified body, King of kings and Lord of lords, coming with an army. Part of that army is mighty angels of fl flaming and fire, powerful angels coming with him. Uh, also, there are resurrected, the, the army includes the resurrected saints, the, re, the, the resurrected saints. Matthew 24, 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, that's the cho same word as chosen, from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. And then Paul wrote about it also in 1 Thessalonians. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up with him as well as the dead in Christ will rise first. And they'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and he shall always 
be with them. So we've got this, we got the, just this picture, we got this grand processional, processional coming from heaven. And he'll go, it will go through and defeat enemies in, in Jordan. Edom is in Jordan. Uh, you know, the armed battle of Armageddon, possibly Egypt, wherever it may be, this, to defeat his enemies and then proceed it, through the gates of Jerusalem to take where Jesus will take his seat on his thro the throne of David and rule there for a thousand years. And with him will be a mighty angels and the resurrected saints. I want to be one of those saints. You know, whether you're alive when he comes or whether you're, he, you, you're, you come from the grave, I want to be one of those saints. Now, here's the question, though. Who are the saints? Who are the saints? We need to do it. We need to really see this. Who are the saints that will be with him? Let's look. Let's look at that. Let's look at those who are with him are dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Fine, fine, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, remember Revelation 19, 7 through 9, 7 and 8. It said, the bride has made herself ready. She is dressed in fine linen, bright uh, and clean which are the righteous acts of the saints. The, 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 the wording sounds pretty similar, doesn't it, to those who are going to be returning with the Lord. Now, we dealt with Revelation 19 in the last session, and it was the bride who made herself ready. We said, okay, this is not necessarily the whole betrothed bride. This is the one who has overcome the righteous acts of the saints for the overcomers. And those are dressed in fine linen, uh, bright and clean. Uh, and so you look at the, you, you look at the, the word white here, uh, clean uh, is the same word in Revelation 19, uh, 11 in that section as it is in Revelation 19, uh, 7. White is a little bit different. Uh, it was bright in Revelation 19, 7, and white here. But the bride is, is, is a Greek word that means brilliant to the point of it being like white. So basically he's saying the same thing. The ones, the ones that have made themselves ready will be the part of the, of the church who will be on this grand processional. Not every, not every believer will be a part of this grand processional the one who has made herself ready. Now let's look at another uh, set of scriptures. Let's look at Revelation chapter 17, uh, verse 12 through 14. Let me see if I, uh, yeah, here, here it is. Let me read it. This is a, Revelation 17 is a parenthetical statement in the book of Revelation that in this particular section of scripture, is, a, is another description of this army that comes with Christ uh, in Revelation 19, uh, 11. So here's what, let's look, see what Revelation 17, 12 through 14 says. Uh, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. But this is verse 14. These will wage war against the lamb. Okay, now this war is the same war as what we talked about in uh, Revelation 19, beginning with verse 11. It's the same war. Uh, and, you know, I just, when you, uh, and you look at commentaries and all that, they, they will say this is the same war as that other uh, is that war. So we see this, they will wage war, that's the same war, with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Same thing that's written on Christ when he comes back. And those who, and, and here, here's the, 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 what I want you to see though. <clears throat> those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. The called, chosen, and faithful 
will be with them. So we need to look at those three words. And now I don't want to bore you too much with, with Greek words, but it's really important. The ones that will be with them, dressed in fine linen and white and clean, are also the same people that are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. That's who's going to be with them on this grand procession. Now, so let's look at, at called. The word, let's look at the Greek words here. Uh, you know, Jesus said, and we'll look at this more ne in the next session, many are called, but few are chosen. He says that in Matthew 22. Many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, the, the Greek word, uh, and there's, you, there's a lot more in your notes that you can get more detail. The, the word called, it, it's, it's used three different ways, basically. As a saint, we're all called as a saint. It's called in, a, in terms of a ministerial calling, uh, like to mean appointed. Like, for example, <coughs> Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul said, I am appointed as an apostle or called as an apostle. He said it's called, it reads called, but it's, he's been appointed as a, an apostle. But there's another way, another meaning of it that really is what um, we're talking about here. Called as being invited to an event. Called as being invite, invited to an event. The invited ones. You know, what we'll look at in the next session, Matthew 22, we'll see that many are called now the word, you know, in other words, many have been invited to the, because it's about the wedding feast. Many have been invited to the wedding feast. Many have been invited. It's like you're invited to a, to a event. Here, the called, many have been called to overcome. Many have been called to be a part of this processional. Many have been called. Uh, the called are those that are, that are called to make themselves ready as a bride. They've been invited to do that. Now, that takes us back to Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are the, are the seven messages to the overcomers. It's the call. We've been, in, we've been invited to become an overcomer. We've been invited to overcome these issues that they're talking about here. And the, and the promises of, uh, of that include this bridal uh, reward uh, that is part of that. So... So what he's saying is those that are going to be in this army are the called. Those that were called way back in Revelation 2 and 3, they've been called. But it's also the chosen. Now the word chosen comes from, a, it's called ekletos is the Greek word, and it comes from the word ek, from, meaning from, and lego, to gather or to pick out. I guess that's where we get the word Legos. I did not know that. But, you know, that's what you do. You pick out, you got this whole big old set of pieces and step three says, take this piece. So you look forever and you pick out this one little piece that's about like that bit, that big. Um, <laughs> and you put it on there and with the end, it turns into a car or whatever you're building there. So what, what that word means though is to, you know, you, many are called, you know, we're called to invite, but then the chosen are the ones that are picked out, from, selected from that group that has been called. The called and the chosen. You know, this was interesting. I've not known this. You know, in Matthew 24, I think it is, where he talks about he's going to uh, gather the elect uh, in, 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 yeah, in verse 24, 31, uh, and the angel will gr a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds. One sky to, that, that word elect right there, it's the same Greek word as chosen here. He's going to choose, you know, the, the called and then the chosen selected from that group. And then the final point of that is faithful, the call of the chosen and the faithful. The faithful are the ones who overcome and remain until the end. You know, some of the prom some of the challenges and the promises to the in two and three of Revelation to the overcomers are be faithful to until the end. Smyrna and Philadelphia for, for sure. Uh, and then 
uh, Sardis kind of in a negative way. And so here's what God is saying. He says the ones that are going to be with him is this one dressed in bridal garments who will be called, chosen, and faithful. They are invi Everybody's invited. Many are invited. Everybody that, everybody that wants to be is invited. There, but he selects out those who have actually overcome and those that have overcome and remain as overcomers even until death. Now, that doesn't sound that hard necessarily right now. But as the pressures of the end times get more and more difficult, that faithful aspect is going to be a real issue. Uh, but we have to stay until the end. You know, Revelation 12, 11 says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even until death. In other words, they, they surrendered their life to, the, to Christ and his purposes even if it meant they had to die for their faith. Now, that's not a real exciting uh, thing to consider, but we're, we're, I believe we're moving into a time where we're going to have to really deal with that. We're going to have to really work that out in our heart. Am I willing to lay down my life for Christ? to the point that even if it costs me my life, I'm not going to turn from him. That's, that's, the, that's the level of commitment the Lord is looking for. But if we will say yes to the invitation, if we will prepare ourselves to over, as an overcomer so that we're selected and we remain that way no matter what comes our way and don't turn from God no matter what comes our way, then we'll be, and put on bridal garments, fine linen, we'll be with him riding on that white horse, part of the battle as he defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet and the kings of the earth and all those that are with him, being a part of the processional that rides those horses through the, through the, through the archway or the gate of Jerusalem where Jesus sets up his throne on the, on the throne of David as king of kings and lord of lords and rules the earth for a thousand years. Oh, man. I hope that's getting you excited. I want to be, I, I, I want to be so... I mean, I know a lot of you are a lot younger than me and you're more worried about getting your kids through school or whatever the issues are. But maybe it's because of my age, you know. But I want to be a part of that so bad. Whatever it takes, I want to be a part of that. Amen? Amen? Give me an amen? Okay. But that's not all. That's not all. You know, it's one of these uh, infomercials. There's one, one more thing here, all right? This is the last thing. This one's even better. Yeah. The New Jerusalem. Oh, man. Because that'll be forever. Uh, the coming in the processional and being, that's only a thousand years. It's a pretty long time. But this is, this is forever. Okay, so we, that picks us up with the next passage. We want to look at Revelation 21 and 22. Now, we're, I'm not going to read all that, but let's start with Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. First heaven and first earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea. And I saw, here's what I want you to see in this verse. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready, listen to this, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Made ready as a bride. So the, 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 Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem is both a city and the bride. Now, I don't know how that will work out. It's a mystery. But it will be a city. I mean, there are gates. There are people can go in and out of it. There, you know, there's all sorts of description there in 21 and 22 about the bride. It is a city, but it's also the bride. It's not just a house where the bride lives. I don't believe. I believe it's actually in some way the bride and a city. So that's the ultimate new heaven and new earth 
in the, in the ultimate eternal age. Now, what's happened now? A thousand years have passed. Okay, so Jesus comes back on this processional. He sets up his throne, Revelation 20. He rules the earth for 1,000 years. And during that 1,000 years, uh, he brings restoration to all the devastation that took place during the church age and uh, before and after, and during, especially during the end. And so the people are... Uh, Conform, you know, conformed to his lordship. But there's an interesting verse, uh, verse 20, 11, verse tw chapter 20, verse 11. At the end of the thousand years, listen to what this is. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, the heavenly father, from whose presence, listen to this, he who sat upon it, and that's the heavenly father, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and there was no place found for them. There was no place found for heaven or earth. The existing heaven and earth there at the end of the millennial. You know, so what's happening, I, I, I'm not, I hold this loosely, but I, I, this is kind of my interpretation. It took a thousand years to do the transformation in the people and do the rebuilding. At the end of the thousand years, it says in 1 Corinthians that Jesus turns the kingdom over to the Father. You know, that's in 1 Corinthians 15. But my take on it, for the Father to come and literally dwell with his people even because of the holiness of God. That because of the curse, heaven and earth, it takes a new heaven and a new earth. The existing ones flee away. I believe it's a literal fleeing away. You know, so I mean, there's a, there's a debate among the theologians that there's a debate. Some say you can, they're just going to be restored or, rec or improved. I believe, and others say it's going to, they're going to actually go in a new heaven and new earth. I mean, that's what it says. If you just read it literally. New, but anyway, however it works out, that we'll, just, we'll take that view. There will be a new heaven and a new earth that will come without sin. Completely whole. The great white throne judgment will take place. Every one who doesn't honor God, will, who doesn't follow God, will be removed and cast into the lake of fire. Frightening, frightening thing. But those that honor God will be in this new heaven and new earth, and that'll be an eternal state. Uh, ages and ages and ages, eternal ages to come. Now let's go back to the new Jerusalem in the context of this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. Now let's go back and let's, let's read 21, 1 and 2 uh, again. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea and I, saw, okay, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So here's what it seems like. That there's a new heaven and a new earth, and the new Jerusalem comes down and is part of this new heaven and new earth. The new Jerusalem is the focal point of the new heaven and the new earth. Hear that now. The focal point of the new heaven and the new earth is the new Jerusalem. Because if you read, if you begin to read the rest of chapter 21 and 22, it's all about the new Jerusalem. There's very little, if any, about the rest of the new heaven and the new earth. It's about the new Jerusalem. Now, what is, let's talk about uh, some of the aspects of the new Jerusalem. First, let's, let's look at who the new Jerusalem is. It says the new Jerusalem is adorned as a bride for her husband. Now, uh, that word, remember we looked at the, the two Greek words, numphe and gune? Uh, how many remember 
Nufe and Nufe and Gune. Nufe is we said was the betrothed. Yes, good Judy. The betrothed bride or a newly married bride. Okay, it's one, but one of those things. We used it for betrothed, but it's both of those. Gune is the word for woman, but it's also the word used for wife. A wife, predominantly a wife in the, in the consummated marriage uh, relationship. Now, when it says the bride comes down, the New Jerusalem adorned as a bride, that is the word nymphe, the betrothed or newly. Right, and I thought, okay, ooh, that kind of messes with my theology here, okay? This is like a thousand years after the bride's made herself ready and the thing's been consummated. How can this be the nymphe? I thought it would be gune. But this is what I, I believe it, it is. And it talks about Guna here in just a minute. We'll get to it. It's Nufe because when this new Jerusalem comes down, the bride is adorned as, it says adorned for her bridegroom, just like a bride on her wedding day. The beauty, there's a majestic beauty of the new Jerusalem that, that comes down. I mean, all of you that, you know, you've, we've all been to weddings and you see the, the bride at her wedding day and, and the bride, probably most every one wedding I've officiated, you know, the, the bride, the most beautiful day that I've ever seen the bride is that on her wedding day. She's adorned for, with beauty for her bridegroom. And that's what it is. That's what it is, the bride. But, it's not, but the, the New Jerusalem is not just the nymphe because if we look at uh, Revelation 21, 9, let me read that. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the la seven last plates came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, Nufe, the wife of the lamb, comma, the wife of the lamb, Gune, Gune. So right there, uh, the, the angel tells John, okay, yes, she was adorned as a Nufe, but she's also the Gune because Revelation 21, 9 says the Nufe the, the bride, the comma, the wife of the lamb, the gune of the lamb. So, the, so we see that the New Jerusalem is the bride made ready, the gune, the eternal wife of the lamb. And all this is in your notes you, that, that you can get on radical pursuit. Yeah, I want to just, I'll quickly, I'll go through these quickly, but seven key features of the bride city that'll make you want to dwell there. <coughs> The bride, one, number one, the bride will dwell in the new Jerusalem. The bride will dwell in the new Jerusalem. Now, it, you know, it says in there that people can go in and out of that city that, that are living in the new heaven and new earth, or the new earth. But the bride will dwell there. The church at Philadelphia tells us that. The bride will, that'll be the abode of the bride. But not every person on the new earth. The bride will dwell. That'll be the, the, the place we, if we're ready, we'll live forever. Forever. Amen. Amen. The, number two, the bride will have close proximity and great intimacy with God. You look at that and you see the intimacy with the Godhead that takes place uh, there. The, the bride will, will dwell in that kind of an intimate relationship. What came to me was John 1.18, where it says about the Christ, Christ and the Father being was one, the only begotten God, God, who is the in the bosom of the Father. Christ in the bosom of the Father, the bride in the bosom of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Number three, the bride city will be glorious in splendor. Uh, you know, we'll live in the midst of that. You see that in Revelation 21 and 22. Number four, the, the new Jerusalem is the holy of holies of the new heaven and the new earth. The holy of holies of the new heaven and the new earth. You know, it looks, you get the dimensions. It's a cube, a perfect cube, the, holy, the new Jerusalem. 
and you know the tabernacle of Moses as well as the king as Solomon's temple were all were both uh, the holy of holies was a perfect cube and so of the new heaven and the new earth the new Jerusalem will be the holy of holies you know that's where the holy of holies in the in the tabernacle and all that that's where uh, that's where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. That's where the, only the high priest could go in. But the bride will dwell there. The bride made ready will dwell there. Number five, the bride will serve him and be his possession like Zadok. It'll be a mission base. Uh, you know, it says that in, in, in that section. I won't turn to the scriptures uh, there. Well, uh, yes, I will. I got it printed out right here. There will be no longer any curse. See, that's one reason I believe that the old heaven and earth had to flee away to get rid of the curse. But it, not sure about that. That the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. And they will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. That's uh, 20, Revelation 22, 3 and 4. Number six, we'll see the face of the Father. And number seven, fullness of sonship will be realized by those who have overcome. So we see this new Jerusalem and we see it's a majestic place, the focal point of the new heaven and the new earth, and the bride will be there in the midst, the closest place to the Godhead for all eternity. I believe that the new heaven, new earth will be a mission base to advance the kingdom. Jesus said in Isaiah that his government will, all, will ever expand and never end. And I believe this will be the base. And God will send out teams somehow from this. But this will be the base. But it's the bride who has made, the wife, the bride who has made herself ready is the one who will dwell there. I show you, he talking about the New Jerusalem, I show you the nymphe, the gune of the bride, of the, of the king, of the, of the Lord, the wife of the lamb. The one made herself ready will be the one who will dwell there. Now, I want to, I got to deal with, uh, I got a couple more points I need to deal with. I need to deal with, this is important, that, uh, especially those that are forerunners and that will speak these words. Then you need to understand this. Revelation 21, 7 and 8. I want to read that, and then I want to talk about it. He who overcomes will inherit these things. The bride made herself ready. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. So it's also the sons for the heavenly father, the ones who overcome. But then it says, for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorceries, sorcerers and the idolaters and all the liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When you first read that, it sounds like, okay, there's two options. You're either living in the New Jerusalem as the bride made ready or you're cast into the lake of fire. One or the other. There's no middle ground. That's what I. That's what I. I, I didn't believe that because of a lot of the other things. But it's like, okay, that's what it sounds like. But it, you know, one, if that's true, if that were the only two options, that would be the loss of salvation view of the overcomers. You either overcome, <coughs> or you're cast into the lake of fire. Now, so, okay, first love. You know, they lost their first love. Well, if they didn't return to, back to their first love, the church at Ephesus will be cast into the lake of fire, even though they were doing all the, the things. So I said, okay, that, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't fit with, to me with the rest of the context uh, of Scripture. Then I began to, to look. If you begin, and, I, you know, reading commentaries too helped. Okay, cowardly. Those are the people who fall away. You know, the, the Antichrist system comes up and says, okay, you either take the mark of the beast or you're not going to be able to eat, you're not going to be able to buy or sell, you're going to go to this prison camp, you're going to do this. And the cowardly say, okay, okay, I'll, 
I still hold, I believe in Jesus, but I'll just do this. The unbelieving would be people that, you know, don't believe. And the abominable, those would be, according to the commentary, those would be people who, who take the mark of the beast. You know, and you can go through them. But you begin to look through these and you can see, okay, it's almost like these people are either people who went along with the Antichrist system or the harlot, one or the other. They went along with one or the other. In other words, they fell away from the Lord. So I don't, here's, here's what I believe. Uh, John is not writing, the Lord is not saying, okay, there's only two options, this or that. What he's saying is, this is the promise. If you overcome, you'll have all these things and you'll be a full son for the Father if you overcome. But he's also at the same time giving a warning because remember, he's speaking it in the context of the church age and the betrothal where the bride is betrothed. We're not consummated in that relationship. He's saying, okay, but if you don't, you know, if you take the mark of the beast, if you fall away and all that, your destiny is going to be in the lake of the fire, a lake of fire. And so he's not saying there's only one or two options because you look at the other context, other scriptures and there are people in there who don't dwell in New Jerusalem, but they're, they have access into it. And they live in that. So I think he's given to a, pro, a, a hope, a promise so that you overcome and a warning if you don't. But uh, not the only two options. It just doesn't fit with the rest of the scripture. Anyway, that's, that's about what I believe about it. And then the final thing about it, well, not quite the final thing, the spirit and the bride say come. Spirit and the bride say come. And we want to say, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Help us be ready. Do this. Okay, let me close with this. I want to close with it. Is everyone the bride? Is every, is every believer the wife of the Lamb? Is every believer the wife of the Lamb? That, that's the question, one of the questions. We had two, two objectives with these three studies. One, to see what the passages say. And secondly, to answer this question, is every born-again believer the eternal wife of the Lamb? Now, I think you've seen, from my view, that every believer is not the eternal wife of the Lamb. Every believer is betrothed is the called the bride because they're betrothed and and they're betrothed to Christ and we are the betrothed bride of Christ. But the eternal wife of the Lamb is the one who's made herself ready. Uh, and we've seen this. In, I'm going to walk through Revelation real quickly. We've seen in Revelation chapter two and three. There's an invitation to overcome. A lot of those promises are bridal in nature. If you overcome this, you know, you'll get these bridal promises. Then in Revelation 12, we looked at Revelation 12. Again, there was a challenge to overcome. And the ones who were the man child of Revelation chapter 12 had overcome Revelation 12, 11, by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and the fact they didn't love their life even until death. And then Revelation 19, 7 and 9, the bride has uh, made herself ready, dressed in fine linen, bright and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. Now, the righteous, we talked about this, the righteous acts of the saints in the context of the book of Revelation are the, over, are the, the, the things that they have overcome. They've, they've overcome, and so those were the righteous acts that they were invited to overcome, and they did it, so they were made ready. Revelation 19, 11 through 21, those who overcame will be a part of this bridal procession. And the new Jerusalem, the overcomers, will be the ones who dwell there. So the point of all that is this. The bride, we're, every believer is betrothed as a bride to Jesus. But the ones who overcome are the ones who will be the eternal wife of the Lamb. And these three sessions were intended to do to show that as well as to explain in an overall sense 
what these passages teach. So I'll close with this. My challenge to all of us is let's say yes, let's, let's lay down our life to making ourselves ready. Let's not let any issue, uh, we'll deal with this next session, but you know, and Jesus sent out the servants and they came up with all these excuses why they couldn't make themselves ready. Let's don't let any excuse keep us from making ourselves ready. The promises are, are unimaginable. How wonderful, how beautiful, how majestic. And, and they're forever, they're forever. So let's give our life to the Lord and the pursuit of him to make ourselves ready. Can we do that? Can we do that? Let me just stand up and let me just pray for us to, to say yes to the Lord. Father, we ask for a yes in our heart. Do it, Lord. Lord, help nothing to come in between us, to keep between you and us, to keep us from being an overcomer. Lord, we're, we're all filled with imperfections, weaknesses, and sin and flesh issues and demons and all, the, all of those things. So, Lord, we know that we are weak. But we ask, Father, that you in your power, in your strength, would, be, would help us to be an overcomer. By the blood of the Lamb, that we would have a testimony of, that we, in fact, have overcome. And that we'll be part of the call, the chosen, and the faithful. Made ready as a bride with fine linen, bright and clean. We cry out, God, for that. Just say, just say the Lord to the Lord right where you are. I say yes to you, Lord. I, I do. I, I say yes to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.